Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorr and I am asked frequently actually what the difference between the Enneagram's 9 types and Carl Jung's 8 mental processes. Are there patterns between these two different models? Can we understand these two from a meta perspective? And I love meta analysis, to be honest, I love exploring connections. And my belief is that the Enneagram is the map of a person's emotional processes while Carl Jung's eight cognitive functions are a map of the rational processes in a person. While Carl Jung was interested in the rational mind of a person and the rational processes behind a person, how we think and how we explore a world cognitively, the Enneagram is interested in how we orient ourselves emotionally, how we experience the world emotionally, and how emotions drive our behavior. So imagine a map here of a person's behavior in the middle and Carl Jung's cognitive functions as the rational processes and the Enneagram's emotional processes and combine these and you get the person's behavior. Now neither this, the Enneagram or Carl Jung's theories are said to be about social or culturally constructed behavior. Uh, in fact, Beliefs and values and the things you learn throughout your life are held separate from these two processes. The processes are the same. The emotional processes and the cognitive processes are the same. But the beliefs and the things we learn and how we experience these things and how we learn to wrap and explain it, that might differ depending on our cultural context. Now this video is about the Enneagram's basic nine types, including the instinctual variations. So if you're interested in learning about the cognitive functions, you should explore my other videos on this topic. Starting with first understanding that the Enneagram has four core emotional drives. Anger, which relates to the eight, nine and one Enneagram types. Shame, which relates to the two, three and four Enneagram types. Anxiety, which relates to the 5, 6, and 7 Enneagram types, and si finally fear, which relates to the three instinctual variations, sexual, social, and self-preserving instincts. The t Enneagram then outlines three different processes or responses to these emotions. First, the introverted or withdrawn process. Then, the extroverted or approach-oriented process. And then, the reactive or adaptive process. The Enneagram describes that an emotion, we can respond either by approaching the emotion, by distancing ourselves from it, or from adjusting and uh, navigating it in a flexible way. So starting with Enneagram 1, the Enneagram 1 is the flexible anger type, while the 9 is the withdrawn anger type, and the 8 is the approach-oriented anger type. This means in the face of anger, the 8 goes... Okay, what is this? Let's explore this anger. While the nine goes, I want to distance myself from this and understand it before I proceed. And the one is, I don't want to be criticized, I don't want to be questioned, I don't want to be near anger, so I want to make sure I avoid it and that I can navigate it and that I can survive in an this environment. So looking at just the names, the 8 as the challenger who approaches and explores anger, the 9 as the person who distances themselves to anger and seeks to resolve the issues behind anger, and finally the 1 as the type that seeks to navigate and avoid and adjust themselves in the face of anger and in the face of potential criticism from other people. Yeah, the Enneagram 1 type is the person that wants to act in a way that makes other people unable to question or criticize them. They want to act in a way that stands beyond any form of critique. They want to excel, they want to be the perfect, they want to be the very best like no one ever was. Actually, it's not about impressing anyone, it's not about doing anything higher or anything creative. It's about, in many ways, living up to expectations and to standards that you believe the world has on you. The Enneagram 1 type is called the reformer because of that desire to constantly uh, uh, navigate all these expectations and to top all expectations, to always deliver at 100% beyond any form of critique or issue. 
Now the nine is called the mediator or the peacemaker because of that tendency to want to resolve any issues behind anger. Why are other people angry and what is it that drives me to be angry with others or other people angry with me? The nine has this baseline of how can I resolve an issue? How can I find the underlying cause of anger in other people? And the nine wants to really make sure that the issue really was resolved. They want to really make sure that other people understood correctly and that it won't happen again. The nine hates conflict. And when they can avoid it, they often act with a high concern for what other people, what might set other people off. They adjust themselves to other people. They make adjustments to others, but they also find it difficult to make adjustments to other people. Sometimes they adjust so much that they forget about who they are, what their true identity is. Sometimes they keep themselves from expressing issues with other, other people just because they don't want to start up conflict. And the Enneagram 8 type is in so many ways the opposite of this. As the extroverted, anger-driven type, the Enneagram 8, the challenger, is the person that wants to give themselves the space or the authority in a room where nobody will have any issues with what they do. They want to be admired by other people and they want to have the respect of other people. And the reason they want this respect is because they want to make sure that nobody will pick a fight with them, that nobody will question them, that nobody will look at them in a funny way or see them in a way that is without their respect. You could say that the Enneagram 8 type wants to buy the right to be cool. They want to establish the right to be cool. They want to establish themselves as capable and skilled enough so that other people will get off their back. And every so often the Enneagram 8 type is about making sure not to adjust themselves to other people, while the 9 is all about adjusting themselves to other people. Now moving on to the 2, 3 and 4 types, the shame types, there you have the people that are oriented by how they see themselves, what they find shameful in themselves, what they find shameful or disgusting in other people, or what they find good or bad in a social context. Ever so often this type and this grouping of types are called the heart types because heart, the heart and the people's love are at the center of this type's questions or issues. Self-love or the love from other people is important to these types. Starting with an Enneagram 2 type, there you have the type that is in many ways reactive in the face of shame. The person that seeks to live and conduct themselves in a way that puts them, uh, that ex gives them the love of other people. Looking at the Enneagram 3 type, you want to, you have the type that wants to be loved, that wants to be admired, that wants other people to see how beautiful, impressive and good-hearted and kind that they are. And looking at the Enneagram 4 type, there you have the person that wants to distance themselves from other people's judgment, the person that is skeptical of compliments and of other people's opinions and that want to establish a strong sense of personal identity. Looking at the Enneagram 2 type, it's ever so often about acting proactively to give things to other people, people that might not even have asked for anything, to express themselves to others, to do something for other people without being asked for it, in the hope that other people will come to love it, will come to need them, and will come to want to have them as a positive influence in their lives. Enneagram 2 type invests in others, often people they don't even know or people they don't even have any thoughts about, uh, just to put themselves in that other person's life. They want to be in other people's lives, they want to be involved in other people and in other, how other people live. Now, looking at Enneagram 3, it is ever much more about the question of how appropriate you are, how good you are and how right you are seen as by other people. You want to establish yourself and who you are as an appropriate and positive influence in society. You want other people to see what you do as good. You want other people to admire what you do. You want other people to love what you do. You want other people to love what you like, who you are with, and what you like, your interests, your passions. You want other people to be involved in what you do. 
you are in many ways the salesman in the sense that you are always trying to sell what you like and what you find important to other people and to get other people to distance themselves from things that are bad that you don't like that you don't think are valuable and the tree lives in that area of what other people want and what other people find important while the four every so often lives far away from that as far away from that as possible the four has little interest in what is appropriate, what is good, what is right and wrong in the society's perspective, in the perspective of what other people like and dislike. An Enneagram 4 type, to some degree, to some extent, distrusts what other people like, what other people see as good or valuable. Just because someone else likes it doesn't mean you like it. Uh, you, because just because someone else thinks something doesn't mean you will think it. The Enneagram 4 type distances themselves from other people's perspectives to get a clear frame or understanding of what they themselves want. So you can imagine here three different ways of handling shame. The first which, it's, which puts you at the question of ad adapting to societal expectations and what, to what other people might find good or bad. The third type that is interested in living in and establishing what is appropriate, what is good, what is right and wrong. And four, the type that seeks to distance themselves from what is good and bad and what other people see as right and wrong, to get their own perspective or viewpoint on what they like and dislike. Finally, the five, the six and the seven, the anxious triad. The five is often described as a researcher, a person that feels to some degree anxious about their ability to manage the real world, like anxious about their abilities at normal physical tasks, anxious about their abilities in basic questions and issues in the group or in a project. And so these types are the preparing types, the types that are driven to go into themselves, to prepare ahead of a task, to learn about it, to make sure they become experts in it, so that they will overcome their inherent feeling of being incompetent at general tasks. The sixth, the loyalist, is in many ways also an anxious type, but they are reactive in the face of anxiety, like the two and the one. They are to the point of uh, wanting to adjust themselves to what other people see as good and what other people see as bad. They want to live up to an honor obligations and expectations on themselves. They want other people to honor expectations they might have on other people as well. They want other people to honor commitments and obligations and they admire loyalty. They want to be loyal themselves in how they do things and they want other people to honor their end of the deal. So loyalty is key for a six type and that's why it's often called the loyalist. The Enneagram seven type, the optimist or the enthusiast is often described as that person that feels anxious or feels bad so they go to a party. Often the Enneagram 7 keeps themselves busy with what keeps themselves in a positive mental state. They focus on what they are good at, they focus on what they have fun doing, what they can uh, get some form of thrill from. And they keep themselves away from the things that might bother them or the things that might bring up negative thoughts or feelings in them. The Enneagram 7 is to some extent bothered by negative input or negative feelings or by doubt or insecurity. And the seven is in many ways a cheerleader, the person that goes, Boo, yeah, that's right, that's how it's done, that's how it's done, boo, yeah. They spread a sense of joy or pep over what they do or, or what their work group does, does or what their project has done. And ever so often, while the five wants to overcome their anxieties or their weak points and have a tendency to isolate themselves while trying to overcome it, the sevens seek to avoid what they are bad at, cheat or avoid it or get other people to do it or do something to keep themselves away from it. It's really, really crazy how it works and how these emotional instincts can alter our impact and our behavior in such dramatic ways. The emotions feed into much of what we think and what we do, so they are just as important as Carl Jung's eight cognitive functions. 
Now, the third instinctual variations are in many ways related to fear. And here's where it gets really interesting. I think that the instinctual variations have the most to do with intuition and our experience of intuition emotionally. Intuition has much to do with fear, while the shame triad has much to do with feeling. And while the anxiety triad has much to do with thinking, and while the sensing triad has much to do with anger. So you could argue that when you experience a lot of anger, you are more in the sensing, rooting part of yourself. While you ex when you experience anxiety, you are in the thinking part of yourself. And while you are in uh, experiencing shame or judgment from other people or from yourself, you are in the feeling center. And finally, when you experience fear or excitement, you are in the intuitive center of yourself. Fear because you're dealing with something novel, something unknown, something you don't know much about yet. Fear because you're throwing yourself into a new possibility because something happened that you don't understand. Shame because you are aware of how other people look at you or you are aware of how you look at other people. Anxiety because you are aware of how good you are doing at some, a mechanical task because you know how well you're performing at something or how well someone else is performing. And anger, because you know how something is supposed to be done. You have a clue, you have an idea about how to do something. You know when someone did something in, a, in an incorrect manner. You know when someone missed or forgot something important. So the final instinctual triad, the sexual, social and the self-preservative instincts, relate to, in so many ways, intuition. And like the others, the sexual triad is extroverted in many ways because it's so much about how we assert our ideas and our thoughts and our premonitions in the world around us. The sexual type has an idea of wanting to assert or place their ideas in the real world to manifest their ego, their thoughts, their imagination, their intuition, their innovation in reality. The social type has the interest of responding to different ideas and intuitions and innovations. They are in the process of managing and adjusting and adapting themselves to different possibilities. And the self-preserving type is in the process of avoiding or gaining distance from intuitions, ideas and, and innovation. Different possibility. They want to retreat to think to understand something before they make a new decision. They perceive the world around them as a little strange or fearful and they want to use theory to understand it. The social type wants to constantly add to and bring people together, connect people, connect ideas, connect different possibilities. And the sexual type wants to assert their ideas and want to get other people to believe in what they think, what their theories are, and what they believe about the metaphysical world. Now, I don't believe that you can make simple rewrites where each Enneagram type becomes a basic translation of NI or NE or uh, SE for that matter. When identifying your Enneagram type, don't stare yourself too blindly at the stereotype behavior described in these Enneagram types. And consider that when there are only nine types like these, that there are many variations within them. You could add thousands of different titles to these types to get different interpretations. Your cultural context and background might identify, even though you have a base emotional process, how you have come, what you have come to believe about this process and about yourself. When understanding the influence of culture and stereotypes on yourself, also consider how it changes who you let yourself be. The good thing about the Enneagram is that it has health levels. It describes what an Enneagram type looks like when it's healthy and when it's unhealthy. So when you hear something negative about the Enneagram 2 type, you can assume it is because of its unhealthy characteristics, not because of its healthy characteristics. If you're wondering which Enneagram types I identify with the most strongly, they are in order the 2, the 1, the 5, and the sexual Enneagram types. Now my question for you is, what Enneagram type are you, and what personality type are you? Let's see down below if you can get some good patterns here, or if you can see any overlaps. And if you already spotted some overlaps, feel free to share them in the comments down below as well. 
And as you might know, I want to make the best videos possible for all of you, so if you are interested in learning about anything or if you want more videos on the Enneagram, do give me a comment down below and I will get on it as soon as possible.